Okay, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you here for this special screening of 99 Homes. Um, at this point, please join me in welcoming the actor who stars as Rick Carver. Among his many credits, he is, of course, an Oscar nominee for his role in Revolutionary Road and a SAG Award winner, thank you guys, uh, as part of the Boardwalk Empire Ensemble. Please welcome Michael Shannon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and congratulations on another great movie. You're, you're, you have very good taste. Your ratio of hits to misses <laughs> is higher than most, I think. Oh, well, thanks. I, uh, I don't take all the credit for that, but uh, yeah, I was lucky to meet Ramin, that's for sure. Yeah, this is his, his, his first, um, I don't know if you'd say American movie? Or has he done films in the States before? No, he, he had uh, At Any Price. Which of was, course, uh, yeah. with Dennis Quaid. Yeah, and then I think Goodbye Solo was set here. I think, actually, yeah, I think they're all pretty much set here. Man yeah, Push yeah. Cart, even? Yeah, I think that's yeah. set in New York City, yeah. For some reason, I think of him, maybe it's just the name, as like yeah. an international filmmaker, but... Well, yeah, he's of Iranian descent, but uh, he was born and raised in North Carolina. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So were you familiar with his work before he brought the script to you? Well, I met Ramin in uh, Venice at uh, the film festival. He had a short film there called Plastic Bag, about a plastic bag that's trying to get back to this island of plastic that's floating around the ocean, <laughs> his homeland. Um, and the voice of the plastic bag was uh, Werner Herzog, and I, I was at the fest festival with Werner, with the, my son, my son, what have you done. So uh, that's when I met Ramin, yeah. And did he instantly start hitting you up with that, hey, let's work together way, or did it take a while for the script to come your way? Uh, no, I mean, when we met, he, he said he wanted to work together, and he said he'd send me something someday, and then, uh, <laughs> and then he sent me 99 homes, so. Because I'm hearing increasingly about how filmmakers and actors meet at festivals. Yeah, it's actually very <laughs> fertile ground for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, it's one of the benefits of, of going uh, to the festivals is you, you meet other artists that you want to work with. Yeah. And this may be a silly question, but when he sent you 99 Homes, was it always with Rick in mind? <laughs> well, that's kind of a... <laughs> dicey question. Uh, I mean, the first time I read it and we met, we just kind of talked about the script in general. Um, he wasn't sure exactly where I fit into it, but um, I think originally he was thinking that Rick would be um, kind of a big star. Uh, just because he wanted Rick to be very uh, charismatic and, you know, kind of in the mold of like a one of those characters Paul Newman used to play, you know, I think, uh, to have that kind of natural charisma. And then he was like, ah, screw it, maybe Mike could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Were you like, thanks? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I looked at it as a real challenge and a, and a great opportunity to do something I thought I hadn't really done before, you know. The reason I ask is because somebody recently pointed out that these three actors, you, Andrew, and Laura, they were saying it would be interesting to see them, I could see any one of them playing any one of these roles. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of glad it panned out the way it did. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, maybe, I think traditionally, historically, I probably would have been considered for like the Frank Green role, you know, the, angry guy in the house with the shotgun or whatever but uh, <laughs> so it was a little but yeah I'm, I'm i'm glad it shook out the way i don't think i could have played the mom i, don't <laughs> I think that would have been a stretch um and what was it about the role of rick that appealed to you oh, i mean he's uh he's a fascinating guy he's very sharp and he's um 
you know, he, he could have easily wound up being like Dennis or any number of down on their luck individuals, but uh, he tried to find a way to work the system to his advantage. And I don't know, I just like the, the, the ferocity of his, his mind and the ferocity, his determination to not, to not fail. You know? I mean, is it, have you heard from other people? I, I found myself actually agreeing with him mm. a lot of time, maybe until like the last 20 minutes. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah, he undoubtedly eventually does some things that are pretty deplorable. But, yeah, I think he says a lot of fairly accurate mm -hmm. things in the movie. I mean, the fact of the matter is there's a system in place that doesn't really benefit the common man very much and you know we could try and dismantle that system tear it apart and from time to time people seem to want to do that or organize you know the occupy movement and whatnot it's one of the reasons the film's called 99 homes is in honor of that movement you know but i don't know it didn't work so then you're left with well i can either be a pawn of the system, or I can try and use it to my advantage. Yeah. Um, I actually have an audience question, and forgive me in advance if I mispronounce anyone's name. I feel your pain. Um, mm. This one's actually pretty easy. Jeff Cohen. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, wanted to know if you did any research on the real estate industry to prepare for this part. Yeah, I had to do a lot of research because I don't really uh, spend much time dealing with real estate. Um, I'm not a big fan of real estate uh, in general. I mean, I don't want to be homeless, but uh, I don't peruse the listings or anything like that. And a lot of the things Rick says in the movie, I didn't really even know what they meant. So I needed, uh, I needed help in that regard. But, um, and I, I spent a lot of time with a broker that, um, Ramin had spent a lot of time with, and uh, it was an incredible experience to to see that up close, to go down to Florida and actually see that environment. Because I think for me, like maybe some other people here, um, when it was actually happening, it was something I read about in the newspaper, but I didn't see it firsthand, and I wasn't there. And, and I, I was always kind of frustrated by the way it was written about because it seemed to be written in a, written about in a very technical way and and uh, I, I was just grateful that Ramin took the time to actually go down and explore the human more human element aspect of it yeah. the broker that you spent time with uh, was there anything that you he gave you during that research that ended up making its way into the movie yeah I mean there was a lot you know I mean he's not quite he's a little more He's a very personable guy. He's very um, gregarious, and and he and he he really feels bad about what he's witnessed and what he's had to kind of enact on certain people. And uh, and I I carried this sense. I he seemed like a very lonely person to me. Um, he he really enjoyed having me there to talk to and and tell stories about what happened and and he would confess to me you know because we'd spend all day at his office and doing stuff and and he'd be pretty business oriented and then at night we'd go have dinner and he kind of let his guard down a little bit and say you know I have a hard time sleeping at night and it's, this has been really hard on me and and uh, I, I feel like I carried that with me when I was doing the movie, yeah. Did he actually take you on any evictions? No, I mean, I didn't, I didn't think that would be really appropriate. <laughs> um, I don't think if I was getting evicted from my house, I'd want some actor yeah. standing there watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might be a fan. It might, you know, lighten the blow. 
<laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> Well, but I did go to some vacated properties. Yeah, I, I saw some, oh my God, crazy stuff. We went to this one place. It was part of one of these track developments. You know, it's like 100 townhomes in a row that all look the same. We went in there, and it had been built with the Chinese drywall which is this really cheap drywall that they make in China that's got like toxic chemicals in it. You can smell it when you walk in the house, it like gives you a headache. And, and these people had been evicted and they just kind of left piles of stuff all over the place. And I looked down on the ground and there was a photo album and I was debating, I was like, I should just leave that alone. But I was so curious, I couldn't help myself. And I finally opened it up, and it was um, uh, their wedding album. Uh. Uh, you, you could tell there had been a young couple, probably newlyweds. That was probably their first place. And and there, you could just tell their whole life had kind of fallen apart. And, and uh, yeah, to see someone leave that behind, pretty sobering, yeah. Did uh, this broker actually end up seeing the movie? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I sat next to him while he watched it. Oof. And it was like, it was an incredible experience. He was having such a visceral reaction to it. It was like a physical, it was like he was hooked up to electrodes or something. Things would happen, you'd just be like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, that's it, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and he was so, I mean, he's so grateful, you know. You know, on the other hand, he's like, please don't ever say my name. In <laughs> yeah. but, but to be able to, to share it with him and have that sort of communion, it was, it, I'll never forget it. Yeah. Was he someone like Rick who, you know, didn't set out to be a broker? But kind of got well, no, he set business. out to be a broker. I mean, he set out to sell real estate. Mm -hmm. you know, he enjoyed real estate, speculating, selling. And then this crisis happened. And a lot of the brokers were told by, you know, Fannie Mae or the banks or whoever, you need to go do these evictions. And they didn't particularly want to do them, but they were told, well, if you want to keep doing business together, you basically got to do it, so well, they did. I know it might seem like a strange word, but you have really great chemistry with Andrew Garfield, oh. who is your scene partner for yeah. you know most of this movie, and he is so impressive to me because he's probably the last person I would think of to play a down-on-his-luck Florida man. Yeah. Um, what was your reaction when you heard he was cast? Well, I like Andrew a lot. I'd seen him in Death of a Salesman on Broadway, and uh, I thought he was pretty impressive in that, and but I wasn't really familiar with his film work. Um, but we went down and did some, about a week of rehearsal before we started shooting, and I was struck right away with the, the intense seriousness he was approaching the part with. Um, he had done a lot of research. He'd spent a lot of time down in Florida, and he had even been like working construction trying to, you know, get on teams or whatever, which is, that's hard to do. I mean, it's hard to find a construction team to work on right now, but, uh, or at that time. And, um, but he, he really would, would stop at nothing to, because I think he knew that he was kind of the surrogate figure for a lot of people that aren't going to get an opportunity to tell their story firsthand so he took it very seriously yeah was it hard doing the I mean in many of the scenes you're getting along but some of these really combative scenes is it hard to work up to doing those and then leave it behind at the end of the day I don't know I mean I'm a big advocate of you know leaving it at work uh, getting it out of your system while you're being photographed I mean, it doesn't make, 
It doesn't do you any good to take it home with you because nobody's going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we actually had a question. Oh, here it is. Uh, Stacy, who has very nice handwriting, uh, wants to know what's the most difficult role you've had to prepare for and why? Smiley face. <laughs> wow. I just played Elvis. That was That's fucking right. hard. <laughs> Is this the Elvis and Nixon mm -hmm. movie? Because I heard that I thought you were playing Nixon. <laughs> I know. I didn't know. Someone told me that. I was playing that. Spiro Agnew. Uh, no. Uh, no, I played Elvis. Yeah, I don't know. This producer I worked with, Holly Wierzma, she produced Bug. And... She I heard a woo for Bug, thank you. Uh, ooh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, she, uh, she just kept calling me up, kind of like Chinese water, you know. She was like, you should do this, you should do this. I'm like, you're wrong, you're wrong. She's like, no, I'm not. And finally she convinced me. And I'm actually really glad I did it, but, uh, you know, I mean, outside of Jesus is probably the <laughs> kind of the biggest most famous, you know, icon you can try and tackle. So, um, and, but it was great because I got to uh, spend a lot of time with Jerry Schilling. Uh, he lives here in L.A. He was a friend of Elvis's, one of his closest friends. He actually wrote a book. I think it's called Me and a Guy Named Elvis. And uh, it's a great book. I recommend it. But um, he uh, kind of held my hand through the whole thing. Made sure I didn't freak out too much. But um, that was hard. And um, playing Kuklinski in the Iceman, that was hard. That was that was devastating, really. I, I studied the uh, unedited interviews that he did for that HBO program. And it was just really, um, to me, a very heartbreaking story because I felt like Underneath all the violence and menace of this guy was just this kind of scared child. And he had a nightmarish childhood. And I think he just, I think underneath it all, he had a very genuine heart. And he was just a really damaged individual. You know? It's interesting because the two roles you mentioned are both real people. Mm -hmm. and um, But you also play a real person in Freeheld, which uh -huh. is in theaters right now, mm -hmm. and he's not a tortured person. He's actually a, a pretty nice guy. Yeah, Dane's a sweetheart. I mean, he's a real quiet guy, very reserved. But um, yeah, I've enjoyed every minute I've spent with him. A real gentleman, you know, a real gentleman. Yeah. So was he excited to know that you were going to be playing him? Yeah, I mean, when we met each other for the first time, about five minutes into it, I I kind of openly confessed that I was absolutely nothing like him, <laughs> uh, which he acknowledged as well. But uh, <laughs> but he didn't really seem to mind. He, he, he For him, it was just about getting Laurel's story out there to, to more people. Laurel's the character Julianne Moore plays in the movie, and... He just loved his friend, and and he had seen me on Boardwalk, and he he liked that pretty well. So he 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 gave me his stamp of approval. Oh, right. I think I heard he was a big Boardwalk Empire fan. Yeah, yeah that yeah. helps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because generally, actors always say that the the person they're playing never wants them to be playing them, and he was actually all for this. Yeah, he was up for it, and Kim Fowley was nice when I was doing the Runaways. I, he gave me his approval. When I did World Trade Center, that guy, I never got to meet him. But I, I don't think it really had anything to do with me. I think he thought Oliver Stone was a communist or something. <laughs> didn't want anything to do with the movie. So those are, I think that's it for real people I've played. All the rest are imaginary. 
This is where I point out that to me, General Zod is real. <laughs> please don't ruin my, uh, shatter my illusions. No. Um, we have a question from Adriana Bella, who wants to know what process you used on developing the characters you play. Another smiley face. Um, <laughs> is it different for each role? Yeah, it, it, it's pretty different. I mean, I, I studied all the various, I don't know, schools of acting approaches, you know, Strasburg, Meisner. I studied with a woman in Chicago, who used Shirt Left's book, Audition, um, Red Arto. I mean, I, I studied them all, Stanislavski. But I can't say I really use any one of them in particular. I mean, for me, I think it's very um, subconscious work, you know. It's not necessarily, you can't map it out. Like, that's never worked for me to be like, well, when I show up, I'm going to do this, this, and this. I just kind of show up and, 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 and see what's going on on the set try and get a gauge of, you know, that environment and the people I'm working with. And, and then I use the information I gathered during my research. And I don't know. I wish there was some way to sum it up in a concise manner. But it's, it's really, it's a mystery even to me. Well, looking at just these roles we've mentioned, I mean, 99 Homes, Free Held, and playing Elvis, how do you choose your roles? I, well, I do different things for different reasons. Um, with this, it was one, genuinely wanting to work with Ramin. It's usually a person that I want to work with rather than the, the role itself, or if I can get on board with somebody's vision. Um, I'm usually excited by the the director uh, somehow um, because it's it's their baby you know um, so yeah it's, I pick everything for different reasons but uh, yeah and you've worked with so many amazing directors and um, I mean like just Jeff Nichols springs to mind mm. I know you've been in all of his films mm. um, what is it you hope for from a director when you show up to set Well, I mean, they're the leader. You want to have confidence in them. You want to have confidence that they that they know what their objective is and that they have a vision and that they've uh, done their preparation, you know, but that they're also open to what's happening in the moment and spontaneous kind of inspirations, um, that they're not closed off, that they haven't... Um, predetermined exactly you know I think I always say most directors are surprised that I say this but I would imagine if I was directing a movie photography would be my least favorite part of the whole thing because <laughs> you're just there every day hoping that all these people will do what you want them to do yeah. but without forcing them to do it just kind of you know by chance um, cause you can't, you can't show up and just bully everybody around cause then people hate your guts. So it's just kind of, you know, it's funny to me, uh, Werner used to always brag about this movie he made where all the actors, he hypnotized all the actors <laughs> and, uh, that made a lot of sense to me. It's kind of like <laughs> movie making is kind of like this fugue state where everybody's kind of in a different consciousness and you know and it's a lot of it I think is really kind of accidental wait did he personally hypnotize them or he had them all yes Werner says he can hypnotize people yeah. <laughs> do you ever wonder if he's done that to you I'm barely conscious to begin with <laughs> it wouldn't be hard now I'm going through his filmography and wondering which movie it was I I'm gonna guess Fitzcarraldo no Ah, no, okay. he, he he never hypnotized Kensky, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. um, we have another question from the audience. Uh, Randy G um, wants to know, what's been the worst experience you've ever had at an audition? 
Where's this? Damn. <laughs> Worst experience. I don't know. I mean, they're all kind of terrible. <laughs> I mean, uh, there was something I really, really wanted. It was a, uh, it was for HBO, and Jessica Holland was directing this movie. It was about the Gilmore brothers, Gary Gilmore and his brother Michael Gilmore. Uh, it was mostly actually about Michael, who was a journalist for the Rolling Stone magazine, but it was about him going to visit his brother in prison. It was just the most beautiful script, and I, I wanted it so bad, and I went in to read for her, and and she honestly seemed totally on board with it, but um, I, they wound up casting uh, Giovanni Ribisi instead. That was, that one, that one, that was a hard one. But that that's the thing, it's like when it happens, you want to jump off a bridge and then 10 years later give a rat's ass <laughs> <laughs> well at least when they said we went a different way you could look at Giovanni Ribisi and go like well yeah yeah that's a yeah. pretty different way <laughs> <laughs> but it must be nice I mean to have directors like Ramin or and Werner like coming to you and offering you roles yeah I mean it's interesting though it's I, I, I always remember what Phil Hoffman said about it that he preferred to audition because he didn't want to get there and do his thing and have the director kind of staring at him perplexed like oh that's what you think this is oh we should we should have talked about this before <laughs> so you know the audition is a good way to see whether you have the same idea about a character but yeah and I, I still audition it's not like I've completely stopped auditioning uh and usually when i audition for a part i don't get it so, really yeah. what was the last audition you did get oh that i did get i can't remember <laughs> i auditioned for nebraska really to play I the sun i didn't get that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i don't even think alexander payne knew who i was i walked in <laughs> I actually would love to see that version. I I saw the the one he made, and it, it seemed to have kind of a different tone than the script I read. But you know, it's a great movie. Whatever. I was uh, fascinated to learn that you didn't have to do any kind of audition for uh, Superman. That was crazy. That was absolutely crazy. They called me up one day and they said, "Zack Snyder wants you to fly to L.A. and go to his house." And he wants to talk to you about something. I said, all right. <laughs> and uh, I get to LA, the airport. I drive up to Pasadena, where he lives, and his house. I'm sitting in his living room. Beautiful panoramic view, bushes, beautiful road, like flower bushes with little hummingbirds flying around. <laughs> Zach walks in, he gives me a cup of coffee. And basically just pitches me the movie. He tells me the whole story of the movie. And I said, man, that sounds amazing. I said, why, why are you telling me this? <laughs> and he's like, well, because I want you to be General Zod. I'm like, are, are you sure? He's, <laughs> and he's like, yeah. I'm like, OK. Well. <laughs> but we did, I actually did do a, a chemistry test with Henry really? to make sure you bought us as lovers. <laughs> <laughs> but it was no. I I went in red with Henry. We did a couple scenes, but but yeah, I, that, that was crazy. And like, were you at all nervous that you would get there and not do what he wanted, or were you like, hey, this is great. I didn't have to read. I mean, Zach was like. He's like, this is really more for Warner Brothers than anything. Because, you know, understandably, they just want to make extra special sure that it's not going to be terrible because they're spending a bazillion dollars on it. So, But, it, I mean, Zach was like, don't, don't worry about it. Just go in and have fun. It'll be fine. 
What's it like going back and forth from a movie? Uh, actually, can you tell me what the shooting schedule was on 99 Homes? It was like 25 days, I think. Okay. Fast. That's amazing. Uh, what is it like going between, like, you know, big budget blockbusters and, and small independents? Do you have a preference? Mm. You know, I, I kind of enjoyed both of them equally. I mean, they're just different. I mean, I, f I feel like every job is totally different. Um, I mean, it wasn't like Man of Steel was more glamorous, really, because even though there was more money, uh, it was still pretty grueling work, um, particularly with all the fights and stuff. That stuff's, you know, takes it out of you. But, um, yeah, it wasn't like I was eating caviar and toast <laughs> every day or something. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I... I uh, there's something about when you when you have a time constraint that 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 unleashes a different element maybe because you're not you don't have the luxury of sitting around pontificating about it you just the sun's going down you have to do something so that really draws out your most kind of primordial instincts you know and in a movie like full of really intense scenes what ended up being the hardest scene to shoot for 99 Homes, uh, it's probably, I mean, there were a lot of difficult ones, but the, f the first scene's pretty difficult because it's uh, all one shot until the uh, body bag comes out of the house. And Ramin told me he wanted to do it that way, and it made sense. I, I knew why he wanted to do it that way, but uh, I wasn't happy about it. Because <laughs> I'm a real, like, perfectionist, so I don't want... If if I if I feel like there was one moment that could have been better, I just want to keep doing it. But I don't know. We did 17 takes, and the, he used the 17th take. Wow. Yeah. And what's up next for you? You've just played Elvis, and I know you have another movie with Jeff that I'm dying to hear everything about. Oh, yeah, Midnight Special. Yeah, that's a really cool movie. I think that's going to come out in the spring. Um with Joel Edgerton, Kirsten Dunst in it, and um, yeah, it's, the less I say about it, the better, just go see <laughs> That's it. what everyone's saying, and I'm like, no, tell me from start to finish what happens. <laughs> well, in the first scene, <laughs> we start on a techno crane. <laughs> I'm at a vending machine. I'm trying to decide, no. Uh, and then, uh, right, I mean, right now I'm shooting a movie called Nocturnal Animals, I'm actually working tomorrow. Um, Tom Ford's directing it. Oh. And uh, it stars Jake Gyllenhaal and Amy Adams. And uh, all my stuff's with Jake. And I've been wanting to work with him for a long time. I've known him a long time, him and his sister, because I did a, a movie with her, a John Waters movie, uh, back, I don't know, before... I was it, 98? You were in a John Waters movie? Uh-huh. I'm trying to remember which one. It's called uh, Cecil B. Demented. Oh, you know what? That's the one I haven't seen. <laughs> Case solved. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know Maggie was in it either. <laughs> yeah, Maggie was in it, Adrian Grenier. Yeah, it's, uh, it was kind of a cool, cool situation. But, um, yeah, so I'm doing that. I got this... For all the people who are wondering when I'm going to do a comedy, <laughs> uh, I have a Seth Rogen film coming out in November. Really? Yeah. This called, year? Yeah. Yeah, it's called The Night Before. Oh. Seth Rogen and Joseph Gordon-Levitt Anthony Mackie. It's actually a real who's who of people. Uh, Lizzie Kaplan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, and that, that woman, she's funny. She plays on Broad City. What's her name? Alana. Alana, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's coming out. And then the Elvis thing and some other independent movies that may never see the light of day. And, <laughs> you know, we'll see. I would like to point out that you were in a comedy called They Came Together, and you were the funniest <laughs> thing about it. That's what that's silly. But I'm only in it for like 30 seconds. <laughs> 
I know when I screamed when I oh, saw when you, you I couldn't it. stop. If you guys haven't seen, if you anyone knows what I'm talking about, you'll know why it's so funny. Yeah, yeah I see nodding heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you were fun. Spike. Yeah, you were the much talked about Spike. Yeah, that's always fun when you play a character that's like talked about the whole movie and then <laughs> they finally arrive. No, that 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 scene was a lot of fun. But I've done a lot of comedy. I mean, I've, I've in Chicago, I did a lot of improv. I still do it from time to time, and yeah. I, I like to laugh. <laughs> well, I mean, wasn't your first movie Groundhog Day? That's true. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the all-time comedy classics. <laughs> it's funny. Last night I was in Malibu doing one of these, and uh, a man walked up to me and he said, yeah, I was Harold Ramis's producing partner, Trevor. His name's Trevor. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of bittersweet to... He said, well, yeah, me and Harold, we'd always, every time you were in a movie, we'd really get tickled by it, you know, get a kick out of it. Oh. Yeah, Harold was, man, what a sweet, sweet man he was. There was one day on his lunch break, he came over to me and said, hey, you want to go play pool together? I said, okay. So I got to go to one of the sets and play pool with Harold Ramos, just the two of us. It was pretty cool. Did you let him win? I think he beat me. I, I'm not real good at pool. I can't see straight. <laughs> well, again, I want to congratulate you on another great movie. Thank, thank you, you so much for being here. And thank oh. you guys for being a great audience. Yeah, thanks for making the time. Appreciate it. Yeah.